And here's some questions and answers. Okay, Ed, I live in Canada. It gets really cold up here. Do I have to take my telescopes in all the time or can I leave them in the garage all year long? Yeah, sure, I do it all the time. I leave telescopes out there. I have two Takahashis that have been in the garage for many, many years. I've never had a problem with it. The only thing you might want to be aware of is if you have a big dop that's got a really big mirror in it, that thing has a tendency to condense when the temperature and humidity changes a lot really fast. The solution to that is to take a drop light and put it underneath the mirror, warms it up just a little bit, and it keeps that from happening. Now, when you do put a light underneath, it generates a little bit of heat. It does have a tendency to attract some critters, so your call on that one. Okay, Ed, I'm new to the hobby. Do I need to get a set of filters? Well, we have to talk about what kind of filters you're looking to get. There's the colored filters that are used for planets, and then there's the sky glow filters for deep sky objects. As far as those colored filters go, I don't know. I've never found those things to be very useful. In fact, if anything, they're kind of annoying. I'll give you an example. One of the first ones they usually tell, tell you to get is the number 80A. That's the light blue filter that is said to increase the contrast on certain features on Jupiter. Maybe it does that. I don't know. I'm just annoyed that the whole thing is blue. I just can't get past that. Maybe you can. I, for some reason, beginners have a tendency to think that they have to have these filters. I don't know where they get that idea. I have never, in the whole time I've been doing this, had, any, had anybody call me back and say, you know, Ed, those colored filters, those things are great. I can't live without those. No, you never hear that. So the second kind of filter are the deep sky filters, and these are used for extended objects. There are two types of those. There's the broad band that sort of kills some of the sky glow, and then there's the narrow band, which lets through a very small amount of light at certain wavelengths. Among the two, the broadband, you know, it works on paper, but in practice, I've never actually found those to be terribly useful. I go straight for the narrowband filters. And I have one here. This one is an Orion Ultrablock. You also see them listed as UHC. O3 is another type of narrowband filter, and these increase the contrast on certain deep sky objects. You'll see it kind of looks like a mirror, and yes, it, that's what it is. It, only lets through certain wavelengths of light, so to you it looks like a mirror. So these things work well on objects like the Orion Nebula, the Dumbbell, the Ring looks good through one of these. If you like to look at the Veil Nebula, these work very well. The O3 filter works very well on that one also. I find that most astronomers at some point do wind up with a broadband filter and one of these narrowband filters. Probably not the first thing I'd buy if I was a beginner, but keep your eye on it. Try one out if you know somebody who has one and see if it's for you. Okay, Ed, how many scopes have you owned in total? You know, the number's not quite as big as you might think. It Partially, it depends on what you define as a scope being owned. For example, I do get donations from time to time, and I usually turn them around pretty quick, and I'll donate it back to a school or a library. Also, if I've owned a scope that I've owned before, does that count as a separate telescope? I'll have to give you an example. There is an Orion 7-inch Maxitov that's been circulating around our club, and I know of at least two people who have each owned it at least three times, and I'm pretty sure I don't know all the other people who have owned it, so does that count? Anyway, the number is not as big as you might think. I, I think I have it around 130 or 140 telescopes, depending on how you count them. That's not a lot. I know people right now who have over 100 telescopes in their house. Okay, have you ever had to abort a review? Yeah, that happens every once in a while. Usually it's because something breaks or something unusual happens and I don't understand and we have to stop things and figure it out. So it doesn't happen very often, but I've got a couple of reviews where things broke and I'm hoping to resuscitate those at some point. I'll tell you one review I've been having trouble getting off the ground. Somebody recently gave me one of the original Mead Pictor 216 XT cameras. That's one of the original digital cameras from the mid-1990s, and I just can't get that thing to work. I remember those times. There were very exciting times because just the very idea that you could point your telescope at you know, the moon, say, and then the image would show up on your computer screen. I just blew my mind that you could do that. It was just such exciting times. It seemed like the whole world was open to us. And this shiny new piece of equipment 
was just there waiting for me and I'm just curious to get that thing to work and see if we could apply modern techniques to very old technology. So if you're curious, this is, let's take a look at what that shiny new technology looks like today. And here it is in all of its mid-1990s glory. I'm told this is the original case the owner had this thing in. So let's open it up. A Mead Pictor 216 XT. Some floppy disks with some software and drivers on it. Instruction manual. And this is the camera itself. Pretty big. And I don't know if you can see this, but the chip in there is just tiny. It's 336 by 242 pixels. But uh, pretty advanced for its time. This is also pre-USB, so everything you see here that needs power has its own proprietary power supply. I'm actually quite fortunate that stuff still works. So the problem is you need a Windows 95 laptop. And I've tried this with a couple of computers already. I'll tell you how far I got. The drivers load, the software loads. I followed all of these directions line by line and everything worked until it came time to get an image and then I got nothing. The computers both recognize that there is something on one of the COM ports, but I can't get any functionality out of it. So I'm reading on threads that even in the best of times, this thing was difficult to set up. So I'm still holding out hope that I can get this working. And if so, I'll let you know. Okay, are you gonna do another video about telescopes on TV and in the movies. Yeah, I like those too. I'm trying to get enough of them so I can do a video, but I'll show you one of my favorites from recent times. This is from the TV show, The Expanse, season one, episode nine. We have what looks like an eight inch F5 Skywatcher reflector on an equatorial mount. And like every Newtonian reflector you see on TV or at the movies, it's backwards. It's pointed towards the ground. But let's take a look at the counterweight. Whoa, hold on, there's no counterweight. There's no counterweight shaft. How is that thing staying up? How is it keeping from toppling over? Please don't release the right ascension clutch. Zed, I notice you do a lot of traveling. Ever get scammed overseas? Yes, I have. A few years ago, my family and I took a trip to China. We spent a week doing all the tourist stuff in China. And one day we went to this open market in Shanghai and apparently this place is famous. Our guide, nice guy, told us before we got off the bus, he said, this is the most dishonest place on earth. If your mother tells you here that she loves you, check your sources. They say they have millions of people going through here. I believe it. The place was on a scale that I couldn't believe. People were just pressed against each other and you could get almost anything you wanted. Knock off Armani suits for $50, Swiss watches, the women were going crazy over the knockoff shoes. Anyway, I found this old hunchback guy with one tooth and B.O. and bad breath selling Montblanc pens. I happen to know that the pens you were selling, these go for about $1,000 in the U.S. here. So I bargained him down to about 100 yen. 100 Chinese yen at the time was about $16 U.S. I still think I'm overpaying for these, but I had a 100 yen bill in my pocket and I figured, well, this would be a good story to tell. So I give him the 100 yen bill, he gives me the pens. Now, see if you can follow what happens next. I turn away and I feel this grimy hand on my shoulder and the guy's real angry. He says, you gave me a ripped bill, ripped, very rude in China. And he motions to me and says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So I reach in my wallet and I get out another 100 yuan bill and we switch. And as I'm switching, I'm getting the feeling that something isn't quite right. But before I can think about it, the guy's just disappeared. Well, I figured out later on that afternoon what he did to me. I gave the ripped bill to my nephew. I said, just go spend it on some candy or something. About five minutes later, he comes back and says, I figured out what he did to you. So what the guy did was a hundred yen Taiwanese bill to a stranger, to a foreigner, looks very similar to a hundred yen Chinese bill. An American would never notice this. They're both red bills with pictures of guys on them. So he had switched the hundred yen Chinese bill that I had handed him with a hundred yen Taiwanese bill that he had pre-ripped and told me to give him another one.
Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.